I would be, I'd be sharing with everyone here, I would be bringing a new perspective about how we actually um, perceive our campuses. Everyone here today, you have something to do with the campus. I mean, you, we are in OE today, right? We are on OE campus, and I mean that everybody, if not everybody, at least a good number of people here, graduate students and all that. So today I'll be sharing with you how that we can make better campuses and how this change can actually spiral, you know, to make better communities and we can have a great nation just because we decided to make certain change on our campus. But before I go into that, I would like to talk to you about something called the Epo Campus. Anyone here has an idea what it means? Okay, I can't see any hand yet. All right, so mine's in motion, so it's interesting for you to know that, I mean, when you talk about minds in motion, you said we should do this, do this, and what? Do this. So where's your mind to start with? Where's your mind? If I ask you, where's your mind? Where's your mind? Some people are touching their hearts. So if you have an heartbreak, does it mean they broke your mind? <laughs> right? But I mean, I would not like to borrow too much. Your mind is actually in your brain. So it would be good for us to start from studying a part of the brain called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is a part of your brain that makes sure that you store long-term memories. That's what it does. It ensures you to be able to recall everything you've been able to learn all through your life. I mean, when you were young, you learned how to play basketball. Whatever thing you've done, you are sitting here today on a blue chair, on a red chair. 20 years after, you can remember exactly all those details because the part of, the brain, the part of your brain called the hippocampus is functioning well, and it does that job of making sure that you can remember everything you've learned. So today, I would be making a parallel between the hippocampus such that we can actually also have long-term impact. We can have sustainable impact on our campuses across Nigeria. But before I go into that, I would like to um, bring some insight into what we actually know, or might not know so much in full detail, about certain things about our campuses. All right, so a campus or campuses across Nigeria have specific interesting roles that they play. You're on campus today, you've passed through the school um, system. There's something that by virtue of you being on campus, it's given you the privilege, it's like a potential that he has that you might not have been able to tap into. And one of them is actually the fact that it serves as an enabling environment. Yes, the fact that you're here on campus means you can try a lot of things. It's on campus, you learned a lot of things you're possibly interested in now. You've had the ability to explore certain things that interest you. It gives you the environment to try and fail. Many, if you go back in history, you discover that um, a lot of um, the um, founders, tech founders, they had Silicon Valley, right, you know, at the art of their innovation. So it gives that enabling environment. Next, it also does the work of a nursery. You call it a university, but it's more of a nursery because it grooms you for the future. There are many things you can be able to do today that you would point to the fact that it was on campus, I learned how to do this thing. So it's a university, but it's also a what? It's also a what? Nursery. Thank you very much. So, and also, he has a very good um, responsibility, or he does a good job as an idea factory. I said earlier that, I mean, if you check through history, you see that a lot of the tech startups that we celebrate today, very big tech giants, actually started at the heart of Silicon Valley in the Ivy League universities back then. So it, it has the ability to gather the best ideas together, and it's, it can churn out these ideas such that these, idea, these ideas will go on to revolutionize the world. Thank you very much. So um, infinite human resources. A very interesting fact about um, campus is the fact that at no point in time, we will there not be human resources on campus. People leave, people gain admission, am I correct? People leave, but every point in time, you have human resources on campus. It is not possible that at any point in time, you will not have students on campus. And this is a very vast potential, if you can actually look into it. And um, also, it does a good job as a talent assembler. It, can, it, it, it helps you to bring the best brains together. Someone came in um, initially and was talking about the fact that you can have the best set of um, minds in a place because it does that work as a talent assembler. You have people from different backgrounds, different experiences coming together, and then if they can put this together, it's like a melting pot that can do a good job. And finally, it does a good job bridging the um, divide between the gown and the town. The gown is like the symbol of the academia, am I correct? While the town is how it directly impacts you know, the society. So all of this together means that if we have, um, if you put this together, it's a very vast ingredient, it's a very vast potential that we all can leverage such that we can have long lasting change that can spiral into building the community and the nation. But then before I go straight into that, I would like to show you starting stories of starting people very quickly. So if, how many of you know this person on the screen? I can see a few hands. Any other person? Okay, yeah. So um, this is Fisai Um, If you know him, you know he's one of the foremost investigative journalists in Nigeria at the moment. Am I correct? There's a lot of stories that you possibly have heard of. So he studied in the University of Ibadan, 
and he studied animal science. When he was on campus, he engaged in campus journalism. That was, his, that was his springboard for it. And today we know him as the foremost investigative journalism in Nigeria. I'm going somewhere. Um, we all know this person, am I correct? Who does, who does not know him? <laughs> all right, if you don't know him, you'll know him after this talk. So um, this is Ashake. Ashake is um, one of the um, rising stars in the Nigerian music industry. And, <laughs> and you'll be correct, you, you, you'd, you'd agree with me that, I mean, he has a vast heritage because, I mean, you know he's an alumnus of OE, am I correct? It should date back to um, his engagement in the amphitheater and, you know, all of those things. So I'm going so And finally, we have Shion Fakuride. Okay, some people are making some noise. So um, Shion Fakuride also is an alumnus of OU, and when he was on campus, he engaged in a couple of activities. He was mo notably, most notably, he ran for the position of the student union president, which he did not win. But that was a springboard for him. Two or three years after his, you know, after leaving school, he was appointed as the Honorable Commissioner Youth and Sports Area State. So I'm going somewhere. So I talked about the fact that the hippocampus does a good job of retaining memories in your brain such that you don't forget these things forever as far as you live. So now, how can we draw some features that this particular part of your brain has such that if we apply it to our campuses, we can have long-lasting change, we can have impacts that would not just spiral on the campus alone, but will go on to actually develop the communities and our nation at large. So one thing about the hippocampus is that it has a multi-directional um, neural connection. It's a part of the brain, but it's interesting in the fact that it works in synergy with other parts of the brain. It doesn't work in isolation. Am I correct? So that's what it does. It does work. It's, it has multi-direction. I mean, when you can imagine multi-direction, it does connect with other parts of the brain to make sure it works very well. So if we can actually apply this to our campuses in such a way that we have very, very good partnerships, and I call this the awakening and coercion of communities. The awakening and coercion of communities. Right here on campus, you have a lot of communities. We have the ISEX, we have the GCIs, and a lot more and all of that I cannot mention now. It's begin, it's high time for these communities to actually rise up. It's high time for these communities to actually stand up to the call, to the clarion call of what they've been summoned to do, of what they've decided to do. And they cannot do this alone. They have to do this in partnerships with other communities. Coercion. They need to partner. So, I mean, it's high time for us, for us to see the change we desire on our campus. It's, we cannot afford to do it in isolation because no one has to be left behind. Can we also say that? No one has to be left behind. That's the goal. Because more than often, if it seems some people are moving faster than, the, than some other people, the change we would get would not be sustainable. So to achieve sustainable goal, we need to embrace coercion. You cannot do it alone. Someone say, I cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. And this is a clarion call to communities on campus. It's high time for you to embrace partnerships, work together with people, um, forge partnerships. That's the goal. That's the very first point of call for us to actually have lasting and sustainable change. Another interesting part of the hippocampus, or another interesting feature, which makes it do its good job excellently to retain long-term memories in your, in your brain, is the fact that it's very plastic. We call this neuroplasticity in medicine. And that's the ability of the brain to actually, it's flexible such that it can, it can, it can adapt, yeah, it can adapt to several changes such that it can still retain its function to do its work effectively. And we need to be flexible. Um, in this present world, it is characterized by four words. You call it volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And if you're not able to actually, um, if you're not adapt adaptable enough or you're not flexible enough to actually, you know, um, to accommodate the changes that the world presents, it might be very, very difficult for you to actually make lasting change. So neuroplasticity, we need to be innovative. That's the key word, innovation. Innovation on campuses. What are the things we've been doing that we need to do differently? I mean, COVID came in 2020 and we saw how it changed the, tide, the, the tides of things. But what was the response that people had to do? You had to be flexible, you had to be innovative in your approach, such that you could still actually retain the things that you used to do before, but do them in a different way. So we have to be very, very innovative. What are the things we do on campus? How better can we actually do them? This is time for ideas to rise. This is time for people to, um, I mean, the sparks, to do those things that, that yeah, used to be done, but in a different way, in a very, very different way. I mean, I used to say that one of the very important things that leaders or people on campus should reach to actually make sure they build campus versions of what they see outside, right? I mean, you see um, 
studying examples of people, things that people do, you know, in the outside world, and then you come to campus and then you replicate it. That's a very good way of keeping um, the, um, the change going such that things do not die down because you're not flexible enough. And, you know, I would bother also on a very interesting um, feature of the Ipo campus, which also makes it able to do what it does, which is to retain long-term memories in your brain. And that's the fact that it can regenerate itself it can regenerate itself. So that's neurohistogenesis. That means that there are certain cells in your brain that if they possibly die off, that's off. That's, that's, but it does the good job of making sure it does what? It regenerates these cells. And that's the problem, or that's, um, it, it calls or it boils down to how we transit on campus. Transition. So when there are certain people that have been building the change, have been doing the good stuff on campus, I mean, they are the one leading the change, leading the you know, innovation and all of that. And at some point when they leave school, the change lives with them, sadly. The change lives with them. And it now goes by, it now becomes the ground zero. The, the other set of people have to start all over again because this set of people that were leading the change at some point could not sustain it and then they had to live with them. So we need to, um, leaders, it's high time for leaders on campuses or everybody to actually make sure that you do a part to make sure that you sustain the change that you have started. You don't just stop there. You don't just let it go with you. You raise other people coming after you. Such that by the time you are living, there are people that can actually undo the same set of responsibilities that you have been called to do, you have done through your stay on campus. And before I end this talk, I would like to bring a very, very interesting insight, which I discovered, and I believe it's a very vast potential we can actually apply. So um, I discovered that if you check this, you would see that um, this, is, this is basically a, a um, pictogram just showing you the um, undergraduate population in several schools, comparing some Ivy League schools and some Nigerian schools. So you can see MIT. How many of us know MIT? MIT, you can see Stanford and you can see Harvard. So if you check through the, if you check the graph, you see that the undergraduate population in these three schools is, is relatively minimal. I mean, in all of these three schools, they do not have up to 10,000 undergraduate population. Am I correct? If you check here. But if you check the three schools, I mean, we have in Nigeria, you can see Lautech, am I correct? You can see OE and University of Ibadan. The undergraduate population in these three schools, I mean, individually, um, each of these schools is about 35,000. So if you can see that Lautech has a population of about 35,000, OE same, UI same. And MIT, Harvard, and Stanford have even divided by seven of these. And it seems we are still not being able, we've not been able to come up to some level of change. We've not been able to do certain things that this school have done so far. It means that the problem is not in population. Am I correct? It means that we have to do what's leverage this population that we have and bring it such that we can convert this number, this advantage in numbers to get the change that we truly desire and see. Quantity can be an advantage. Am I correct? Quantity is not always a problem. Am I correct? So, um, I also have a picture here I would like to call to your attention. This is a picture of the brain, am I correct? Or these are pictures of the brain, yes or yes? If you check these two brains, you do not exactly have any difference between these two pictures. Some might say size, but it's because the, they are, I mean, there's a way they, when you look at the, what's it called? The way they are arranged, there's not so much difference. It's pretty much very, very similar. A little bit differences in maybe how the, I mean, I don't want to use terminologies about how the foldings and all of that look like. But interestingly, there's not so much difference there. And I'm going somewhere. One is an American brain, one is a Nigerian brain. American brains are not different from Nigerian brains. Again, American brains are not different from Nigerian brains. And finally, I want you to take this conversation for that. Let it not stop here. Let it not stop here. Ensure that you, because we cannot stop the conversation, let it go, let it go. Thank you so much.